welcome back to the Village Bonfire for another episode of the Wild Sacred Journey podcast. A podcast not just for your mind, but for your body and spirit too. Here we don't just talk theory. Instead, we compassionately engage with our lived experiences and a wide variety of topics together, all to invite the question, in these times we find ourselves in, how do we be more human? Thank you for being here. May these conversations awaken, inspire, repair, and evolve something deep within each of us and serve the wild, tender aliveness of our personal and collective hearts. Hello. Welcome back to the Wild Sacred Journey podcast, the first episode of 2023. So happy new year. And um, yeah, it's as I was sitting with sort of the shift from 2022 to 2023, I was really feeling the sweetness of some, some seeds I started planting in, um, in 2022, one of which was this podcast. And so um, it was really sweet to think back on. We've, I've had 10 conversations now, plus a bonus one. This will be the 11th. And, you know, just some of the themes that we've covered, creativity, alchemy, dissatisfaction, healing, and spirituality, breath and body, justice, um, rupture and repair, um, birth, death, and all the things in between, right? And so it feels, um, you know, one of the things I was setting out to do was, was really rooting into like, what does it mean to be human? And how in sort of what feel like really dehumanizing times, how do we continue to deepen into like kind of double down on being human? You know, we live in a world where virtual reality is, um, you know, very, very much a part of our day-to-day lives. And that's not inherently a bad thing, but I do think an important piece of staying with that is, um, yeah, continuing to root into and I mean root in a really like embodied way, right? Like in the ecological sense of root, like to come down and through the body, to have a relationship with land. Um, you know, I think it's important to keep that component. Otherwise, you know, we risk really losing any kind of sense of what's real um, and any kind of sense of a deeper relationship with with the tangible tangible aspects of, of what it is to be human. So today's a solo episode. And, um, so before we kind of dive into the conversation I have in mind for us today, which is on animism, which I think is a really important part of this rooting deeper into humanness process. Um, I want to go ahead and start as we always do with opening our village fire, lighting our candle. And taking a few deep breaths in and out together. I'm aware that, you know, it's kind of funny to be lighting this digital vigil, v- digital villagel, <laughs> digital village fire. Um, in light of what I was just saying about sort of the importance of kind of our material relationships, our material connections, things like happening in real time in real life. And yet that is the benefit also um, of, of being able to straddle these worlds of virtual reality of, of the digital world and the physical tangible one. And medicine people, whether we call them shamans or curanderos or you know, whatever, whatever they call themselves, right? The medicine people throughout history have always walked between two worlds. And so here we are walking between worlds, acknowledging the actual land where we each are. All the things in the soil all the things at surface level. All the things above us in the sky, the air, the ether.
acknowledging our own bodies, our own hearts, that meeting point between earth and breath. between where we each stand, the actual land on which we each are in this moment. And then this collective digital space that we are coming together around. And so, one of the things that I think is really powerful about working with the subtle body, working with the energy fields within and around the body, is it lets us acknowledge these multiple horizontal layers of um, like simultaneous truths, simultaneous existences, right? And, you know, a lot of times we we society often encourages us and teaches us to really pay attention to things at the level of mind and at the level of uh, action right so thought and action those are the two things that are prioritized <laughs> and sometimes emotion right but there's when we start to pay attention to listen deeper to some of these subtler threads we can start to hear when something's not ready to be true yet or not ready to um for us to have full awareness of it yet not ready to be brought forth into action but is like that seed germinating in the dark soil right so it may not even have fully put roots down yet it may not even have sent that radical root that first shoot down into the earth right and it definitely hasn't brought anything up towards the surface yet but, and so, so I share that because, you know, one of the ways that we start to, I think, deepen into what it is to be human and to sort of, again, bridge this, our ability to be in this sort of imaginal virtual reality world with what it is to really be in our bodies is to pay, be able to pay attention to and be aware of these different layers of existence, right? And so, you know, I notice for me when I'm like sitting with kind of the new year, I'm sitting with like, okay, what, what is the path beneath my feet in this moment? And that means like what is actually here, but also like what seeds are germinating beneath the soil? What threads do I feel like aren't here yet, but may be calling to me? And that's part of how, so for me, when I set an intention, right, it's not like, this is where I want to go. It's like, what threads are calling to me? And even if it doesn't make sense yet, even if the vision isn't clear yet, how do I say yes and follow them? Right. And so to do that, we have to be able to listen deeply and quietly. So I do that personally. And then I'm also listening into like threads of like the larger world, right? My larger professional ecosystem, what's actually happening in the wellness world. And there's a lot of trends there that I find very concerning and that I think are um, also a piece of sort of this like becoming disconnected from what it is to be human and and to be human and yet to have this ability to be in these in these enlightened states of consciousness or these altered states of consciousness consciousness or these like imaginal and virtual worlds, right? And what trajectories are we on if we keep the path we're on and what threads are kind of calling us in deeper? And then I'm also bringing that to this podcast, right? What threads of conversations are going to serve me, are going to serve you, are going to serve our collective whole um, so one of the things that I want to talk about today, uh, is animism, because I think animism, it's something you've probably heard come up in conversations that we've had, but I haven't addressed it directly. And for me, it feels like animism is, um, yeah, is a really big piece of keeping us in this imaginal space, but also in a deeply embodied and deeply relational way. 
So if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably noticed that I subscribe to a very animistic cosmology. And by that, I mean a worldview wherein we exist in a living, breathing, soul-infused world, right? So plants, animals, geological features, elements, all of that, right? All have a certain level of soul, a certain level of consciousness, if you're talking about it in terms of like quantum uh, theory, they have more of like, I think it's called form or, you know, the, the frequency, a wavelength, right? But if you think about it, if everything is energy, everything is molecules moving, vibrating, right? Atoms, then all of that, the, the different vibrations of each thing create a different frequency, create a different harmony, right? And so all of that has some sort of signature imprint, right? Which is a certain level of consciousness. It's a certain level of soul. And so animism believes that this soul infused world interacts with us and actually dreams through us. And we're a part of it, not separate from it, nor are we as humans, a master of it. Animism is also a worldview where open curiosity, rigorous inquiry, and like a wonder-filled mythological dreaming are equally important ways of exploring the big questions like, why are we here? What's the point? How do we navigate birth, death, and everything in between and around it, right? Animism believes our spiritual beliefs, which I define as um, our search for greater meaning or wisdom or context within our lives, right? So an animistic belief says our spiritual belief should guide our gaze as much to the earth and its ecosystems as it should to the heavens and these more subtle or imaginary realms. Animism believes like, um, or I should say me through animism, I'm not speaking for all folks who subscribe to animistic beliefs. And, you know, I also want to frame up really quickly too, that obviously my perspective and my place in this world and in this body certainly informs my beliefs, right? So I'm sharing everything I share today is, is, um, yeah, well, first off, it will keep growing and evolving as I do, <laughs> but it's also coming from the perspective of a white bodied European descended human living in the United States of America and regardless of my invisible inner truths or experience, right, my body appears to a passerby on the street as able-bodied, as young, as cisgendered, as heterosexual, as female. Now, I don't necessarily identify with all of those labels. Personally, internally, that doesn't, isn't or doesn't feel true to my full experience of myself in the world. But I want to frame up that, that to all intensive purposes from the outside, I have a lot of privilege right? Privilege of, of looking a certain way. So that informs where I'm coming from with all of this. So coming back to kind of this animism, right? So animism, as I experience it, believes that our most profound experience of the world happens when we allow ourselves, when we train ourselves to perceive and trust in these horizontal, simultaneous overlapping layers of meaning, ways of knowing and understanding, right? So animism at its heart is really in many ways that and space, right? Where we can be animal and soul, perfect and flawed, physical and subtle, mind and body, science and mystery, right? And then within that animism, within that and space, then we deepen into understanding that we don't assume healing as a continuous path in the direction of an abstract ideal, right? Plato philosophy, um, Plato, I think, was the one who first introduced the idea that there are these abstract ideals and that everything in existence is like some derivation of these abstract ideals, right? And so that's part of where ableism starts to come into a lot of our healing practices, because unconsciously it's informed by this idea of this abstract ideal. There's some abstract idea of health out there and what a body should look like, feel like, and how it should operate, right? And then anything that deviates from that is considered less than and has to be brought like up to it, right? To the best of our ability. 
instead of honoring sort of this multiple horizontal, this multiplicity, this horizontal layers of meaning and biodiversity, right? A rich ecosystem, which says that evolution doesn't happen because we're trying to go to some ideal. Evolution happens in the places where we encounter the world and find it poisonous or indigestible or unsafe, right? And we have to adapt. And so bodies that deviate from some static ideal are not considered problematic, needing to be healed, right? That's part of why I've moved away as much as I can in my own personal practice of talking about healing. And instead I try and talk about wholeness because it's more about being whole. And that's really what animism is about in many ways. It's about being whole, right? So it allows us to weave different threads into a more resilient, inclusive, and thriving whole. That's what that ecosystem is. So this also means because we're not aiming for some abstract ideal, because we're not looking quote unquote up, right? That animism also sort of invites us to believe that the world is interconnected and interdependent, all things which means that while there's a time and a place for chains of command, the world does not inherently organize itself in hierarchical, vertical, or top-down ways. Right. And then energy and frequency are the common language that unites this aliveness that expresses itself in all these different forms throughout the world. So I think it's important to draw a distinction here between animism and anthropomorphism. So anthropomorphism ascribes human-like attributes to animals or things and, and unconsciously or subconsciously or consciously assumes the world is made in our image. Animism assumes we are one expression of the world, one expression of this energy of aliveness and that the other things are also expressions of that aliveness that are not the same as us, right? So that invites us into a deeper curiosity about our differences, which then allows us to actually view each living thing as a potential teacher, right? Or a mirror or a reflection or something that helps us learn and grow and evolve. Humans have co-evolved with animals and with um, plants and their environment, right? For thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, there are some people who argue that it may have, that humans may have started learning to make sound because they heard the different sounds birds make, right? And so while we've always been able to make sound that perhaps the variety of sounds that we can actually make came because we listened to birds, right? So many people would call these views new agey, right? But none of these beliefs are new. Animism is ancient. It's woven deeply into our DNA. Our long ago ancestors all believe variations of this worldview. And these animistic views of kinship a sense of like that everything in the world is my sibling or my kin in some way, right? Are still lived and practiced in more indigenous and land-based cultures around the world today. Before there was capitalism as it exists now, before there was Western medicine, before colonialism, before there was a separation of mind from body and soul, a separation of human from animal, before reductionist science and many of the systems and beliefs that we've inherited and take for granted as quote unquote normal, there was animism. So I also want to be clear here that I'm not throwing babies out with the bathwater, right? So there are helpful things that have happened in science through science and Western medicine. So I'm in no way attacking any of those things. And there's also no perfect moment in history where there hasn't been violence, struggle, illness, right? So none of this is, you know, I think a lot of times too, when people start to get into where I think some of these quote unquote, new agey, more animistic views can start to maybe dilute a little bit of what animism can be is when it kind of slips into this like idealistic and honestly unreal <laughs> um 
romanticization of like the past. Like there was this time when humans lived in harmony with nature and we just need to get back to that. And like, yes, there were times when humans lived in a different relationship with nature than we currently are. And that doesn't mean it was perfect. And that doesn't mean that everything was in harmony and everything was right, right? The seeds that we live now or the, the trajectory that we're on now, the fruits that are ripening now, that we're experiencing now in our lives, were planted where the seeds that were planted before, right? So everything that anyone has ever lived was planted by someone who came before. <laughs> so the trajectory that we're on now is a result in somehow, some way of a series of choices that our ancestors made. So yeah, so I'm not romanticizing anything in the past by sharing all of this. And for me, I firmly believe both in my own experience and my work with clients and what I witnessed in the news and my varied interactions, I firmly believe that many of the wounds and illnesses that we're actually grappling with that we might even call like the modern ailments, right? Of being in a human body and trying to exist in these modern times are happening because of a profound loss that we experience, that we continue to experience, that we have experienced and continue to experience when we began assuming a dominant narrative that did not include animism. And so part of why I think animism is really important is I believe if we can start to reweave that back into where we are now, that starts to plant new seeds for the ones who will come after. So that can start to shift the trajectory that we're heading on and possibly change culture and change the future. So what then was lost and what stands to be regained by shifting this dominant narrative to kind of include animism? Right. So <laughs> I, I think in simplest terms for me, it's like that idea that wherever you go, there you are. Right. And so if we have these beliefs that are very empirical based, um, that lack wonder, that look for answers rather than questions, that are actually very monoculture and hierarchical in a lot of really um, misguided and unhelpful ways we end up with where we are, right? And because we're not questioning those beliefs, when we start to try and interact with environmentalism, when we start to try and interact with social and racial justice, when we start and equity, when we start to try and interact with wellness, right? We bring this same culture to that. So in the biological sense, culture is the Petri dish right? The, in, the situation in the Petri dish, the environment in the Petri dish that informs how a cell develops, right? And so the water that we swim in, which is culture really informs how our cells develop, how our thoughts think, how our emotions move, right? So if we want to change the trajectory that we're on, part of it is that we have to change like actually how we perceive the world, because that changes the culture that informs how our cells grow, how our cells express, express themselves, which then if we're changing that Petri dish culture, changes the culture that we're creating, the art that we create, the government systems that we set up, the conversations that we have, right? These other, the food that we, you know, the food that we grow and then eat and cook, you know, cook and eat, right? So it's not, it's not enough just to go through the motions of something, although that's not nothing, right? But we have to understand why or our, our why are our, our, the thing we hold as deep and true, like our rooted values have to really be aligned with something that is different from the overculture that we're living in these days. And so that's where I think animism starts to come in, right? 
is it sort of can shift. We're not then bringing some of our misguided programming to the tools and techniques we might be using to try and change the world or to change ourselves or to change our health and wellness, right? Which then means that rather than it only taking us so far, you know, I mean, I know so many clients who have been in therapy for years and years and years and years and years, right? And they have a lot of awareness about why they feel the way they feel and what happened to them in their lives that got them to where they are now. And they have a lot of awareness around their thoughts, right? And their patterns. And yet nothing has actually changed, right? In how they feel about their lives or in their relationship with their own patterns or in the world around them, even in the situations and circumstances that the world is pulling to them. And I was there too. Right. So I, uh, when I first began my sort of more like my wellness journey, my more intentional journey of awareness and, and some might call it healing. I really struggled with depression, with a deep sense of being lost out of step with life. I was really at odds with my body. I, I had a, um, unhealthy relationship with my own body, um, feeling really, um, yeah, un un at home within it. (laughs) Um, and you know, and I caused it harm through how I did or didn't move and what I did or didn't eat. Right. And I knew my brain was telling me lies a lot of the time, but also thought my brain was the pinnacle of who I was and didn't know how to outwit my brain. So when I first stumbled into a power vinyasa yoga class, something started to shift. It started to get me out of my head and into my body a little bit more. I started working with my breath, right? Then I started working with my body outdoors, growing the food I ate. I started farming and that also started to shift things. I started to become more aware of like seasonal cycles. And again, like what I was producing wasn't sort of abstract and all at the head level. I was like actually producing tangible things. I was like putting effort in and seeing result back and that result nourished me. And then I put more effort in, right? So there was a more of a direct causal nourishing relationship that was happening that I wasn't finding back when I was in college. And, you know, all of my effort was put towards like thinking thoughts and writing papers about the thoughts that then other people would read and think thoughts about, and then write me notes about what they thought thoughts about. And all of that was still really beautiful. Like I learned a lot. I grew a lot. I expanded my awareness of certain things in a lot of ways, but it was really disconnected from my body and my body's actual needs. Right. So I started doing yoga, I started farming, and yet a few years later, I found myself still struggling with a lot of the same challenges, right? A lot had changed, and yet there was also a lot that hadn't. My understanding of myself and life had changed, but my circumstances were still mirroring to me a lot of the same things, which let me know that something hadn't really changed, right? Because if I, if something had truly changed within me, in theory, like, like, I would have new circumstances and new dynamics showing up, right? A lot of the same kind of like relational fuckery was like showing up in my life. And I'm like, well, I thought I'd changed and I thought I'd grown and like, you know, and like I had, and there was like, I started to become aware that there must be some deeper layer, some deeper level that I hadn't tapped into. Right. And so I started, um, my energy training at the time which was much more shamanic based, much more um, indigenous wisdom tradition based, right? And, And was a much more animistic approach. And that's when things really started to change, right? And so there's a couple little takeaways here that that sort of for me, right, which is that some modalities, tools, and approaches are still more interwoven with their animistic context and therefore challenge us to fundamentally shift how we relate to the world and ourselves in order to work with them, right? There are other tools and modalities that are maybe newer and came into being after, at least for those of us of European descendancy, after we are over culture sort of began to move away from some of this more animistic relationship with the world and worldview, right? And so those don't have animism woven as deeply into them, which doesn't mean that they don't have value, but it does mean that they may not, um, the, the, the value that they have will probably only take us so far, right? 
And then the other takeaway is that some tools have been more removed from their animistic context. And so while they they may have originally had it and then they've evolved with us because we've carried them, we as the carriers of these wisdom traditions have determined what parts have been brought forward and what parts have been left behind, right? And so while those things may still have as the power to help us grow, they become band-aids if we aren't also exploring what those modalities were before or how those modalities might now be able to bring us into a different relationship with ourselves and with life, a different cosmology. What, what is yoga if we stop thinking of it? You know, we'll never go back to a time when yoga was was as it was practiced in ancient India, right? That's just not the world we live in anymore. And yet, what is yoga? What's possible through yoga? Is there a deeper level of healing, wholeness, wellness, whatever you want to call it, that yoga can bring us if we stop creating yoga classes that are based in our capitalistic misguided patriarchal, misguided spiritual bypassing understanding of the world and root reweave animism back into it or reweave some sort of deeper embodied cosmology back into it. Right. So, and that's, you know, and that's, that's, there's a question here of like, Yeah. So a modality is either, you know, it's that same thing about a tool or a weapon depends on how it's wielded. Right. And so it's the same with modalities. They may help us, but, you know, if we're really looking to change culture, if we're really looking at like, okay, we're facing a lot of crises in our times and what do we need to like, what might change the trajectory that we're on? Because I think that's a question a lot of us are holding, a lot of us are sitting with, you know, we have to look at how are we using the tools that we have and are we using them in ways that will change the trajectory or are we using them in ways that just reinforce these old inherited unquestioned patterns? So the culture that we live in currently assumes human supremacy and within that certain skin tones, religions, gender and sexuality expressions and abilities assumed as better or higher expressions of goodness than others, right? And that better, higher goodness are all like in air quotes. <laughs> so that's that that current um, like culture that I was talking about earlier, that Petri dish culture, the water that we swim in, the thing that we're not even aware of because it's just what we've, the unquestioned assumption about what's true or um, how the world works right? And so if we don't question them, and if we don't look at where, not just them as thought patterns, right? Like we can read something and be like, ah, yes, like, okay, now I understand I'm seeing something I didn't see before. And I understand. And now I'm looking at it differently, right? And yet our behavior doesn't change because, because in the energetic understanding of the world, right? This, this Petri dish culture is Petri dish is actually influences how our cells are expressing themselves, right? Which means that the beliefs that we hold are stored and influence our soma, our body, right? So it's not just about coming to a new mental understanding of things. We have to actually come to a different physical understanding of things. And then that creates a different physical expression of things, which also helps rebuild, you know, and and work new neural pathways, right? So if we follow animism and this idea that humans are one expression of aliveness in this vast web of kinship and consciousness, no better, no worse, right? Then we also assume there's this moment, this particular patch of land, this context, which fosters the growth and which fosters our growth and experience, right? So it widens the influences. It widens in some ways that Petri dish so that what we are what's informing how we're growing is not just how we're thinking about things, but also the way the sun moves through the sky, the way the stars move, right? How that influences seasons, how that influences times of life, like these cycles, right? It also 
you know, it, it's so the Petri dish is then influenced by what's growing, what we're eating, what plants are blooming at that time, right? What animals are around us, what, you know, mycelial network is nearby, right? The fungus and the mushrooms. So our bodies then are in immediate relationship more. And so our, our understanding then comes less from this like heady space of belief and more from this rooted kinship with the world, right? So that, tra- that challenges supremacy. That challenges um, like gatekeeping, right? Like we're less likely to fall for cults and gurus and, you know, personality, like big personalities, like we're less likely to be pulled off center by those if we have deeper roots. So it also challenges monocultures, right? Monoculture by monoculture. I mean, we're seeing that in agriculture, monocultures are weaker. They are not um, like one pest could come along and wipe out the entire crop, right? And then that's part of why in our current agricultural practices, at least here in the US, there's a lot of spraying, there's a lot of genetic modification, right? And all of that. Whereas when we look at old growth forests, like environments where people haven't had a lot of um, influence or where people are working with them, right? So again, this is not about humans being a blight on things. Humans have helped plants spread their seeds, have helped ecological systems thrive throughout history. So it's, it's, but it's, it's that mindset shift of, am I here to control because I know better Or am I here to listen and learn and see the relationships that are already here and realize if I do this, what's the effect of that on this larger ecosystem? Oh, interesting. That didn't go so well. Maybe I shouldn't do that again. Or, oh, interesting. That actually helped this other plant thrive, which then rippled through the ecosystem in these other ways, right? So some of that's, yeah, science. And it's not separate from animism because it's understanding that the world has something to teach us that there's that that human supremacy is not a thing right and so on a more like sort of symbolic or um i don't remember the word i'm looking for right now but but kind of a more um meh. Yeah, we'll go with symbolic. That's not the word I'm looking for, but close enough. So that idea of monoculture, yes, it's in agriculture, but it's also in monotheism, right? It's also in the stories we're telling ourselves, that myth of individuality that we in the US really have, right? And we see that played out in our movies. All of our hero movies are this lone hero (laughs) and all the weight of the world rests on this hero's shoulders and this hero has to go out and like solve everybody else's problems, right? And like, that's, you know, sometimes that's inspiring. That's not inherently bad. It's also not how the world actually works, right? It can also be monotheism, right? So our myths are our spiritual beliefs, right? Like ancient practices usually had multiple gods and goddesses, right? And a lot of that, many people argue, is in, is uh, happen simultaneously with people having more animistic worldviews. And the second you have one God, right, you run the risk of then having one story, which then influences, it, it creates like in a, in a mythological sense, it creates like a, a, a monoculture crop, right? Then your ecology, the ecology of your myth, the ecology of your beliefs become a monocrop, which is a little more fragile, maybe certainly less representative of the actual world that we live in, right? Which then also leads, can lead to like more of the spiritual bypassing and more of this sense of like that hierarchy, right? One God, and then we have to try and reach heaven and the God's up above us and we're trying to reach heaven, right? 
So monocultures can also be about different bodies, abilities, gender and sexuality spectrums, right? So all of that. And so animism challenges all of that because it says there's no one access point to aliveness. There's no one access point to, um, to story, right? There's no one access point to spirit, to God, whatever you want to call it, right? It also is good because it gets us out of the monoculture of our own head, right? Gets me out of the echo chamber of my own head. I, my thoughts believe certain things and run in certain loops, right? And I'll be off in my loop. And then I'll like, look out the window and I'll see a squirrel doing something. I'll be like, oh, that's interesting. What's that squirrel up to? And it like breaks that loop in my head and brings me into something else that's happening. Right. And so again, in this world where things are becoming increasingly like, I mean, currency isn't, I mean, it hasn't been, at least in the U S it hasn't been linked to the gold standard in a while, but you know, at one point in time, currency was like rooted to something more tangible and measurable. And then it's gotten increasingly more abstract, right? So we now have entire, um, entire, uh, economic systems, right. That are really rooted in like nothing that you'll ever be able to touch. (laughs) And again, that's not inherently bad, right. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things are inherently bad, but on a nervous system level, our nervous systems, our bodies are designed to look for safety in our environment. And if we're so caught up in this virtual world that we've lost connection with things that are tangible, with things that are actually around us, things we can touch, things we can smell, things we can taste, things we can, you know, see with our eyes. Sure. But even that gets a little more abstract, right? So if we've lost complete connection with that, like our nervous system's kind of like, well, where are we and what's happening? Like, no wonder we feel lost all the time, right? So animism reminds us too that intuition, initiation, mystery are our birthrights, right? No guru, no cult, no external power source can take that away from us or tell us that it's the only thing that can get us there, right? This is not to say that we don't need elders and we don't need medicine people, right? There's also a trend in the wellness world that has me slightly concerned, which is that we've really turned it we're, we're because without this animism, without this deeper sense of sacredness of things, without actually knowing how, when something is sacred and how to hold something as sacred, which is part of another piece that animism can teach us. Without that, we're actually, I'm concerned that we're devaluing a lot of these wayfinding tools, a lot of these um, accesses to these, these modalities and approaches that allow us to access mystery by um, letting them all become side hustles, right? Because we don't have elders in our, we don't have community elders. We don't have community medicine people. Those roles got lost somewhere along the way. So there's kind of this balance of where I feel like animism challenges me anyway to take responsibility without giving my power away. And so there's this, yes, it's sort of democratizing, right? It takes things out of that hierarchy, out of that echo chamber, spreads it a little bit wider. And yet it also encourages me then to take full responsibility. What are the ripples that I'm creating as I move through the world? And what how is that affecting that larger ecosystem, right? So there's no individuality here. Like, yes, I'm unique. And also I'm part of this larger whole. So by me doing what I'm doing, how is that, is that serving the evolution of aliveness, the evolution of humanity, the evolution of our world, or is it, um, 
aligning itself or my actions aligning themselves with something that's um, not serving that, right? Um, so because, yeah, so that, that the way that it mirrors the way that, that, um, my, an animistic cosmology allows me to view the world as a mirror and also as a teacher is kind of a way that I can kind of bounce off of a little bit to come to understand myself a little bit better and understand how my actions, um, affect others a little bit better. So then animism also, I believe, challenges that very notion of good or bad. So again, that sense of because it widens out this space, it widens that Petri dish and that culture, it, it, um, it reminds us that everything is cyclical and there's a much larger web of cause and effect than we can grasp. So we may be able to track our ripples <laughs> through the world. And we can also only see our ripples so far. We can imagine the trajectory. We just keep imagining where those ripples are rippling out to. But we don't actually know, right? So that's part of where that mystery comes in. That sense of like, ah, I can see this and I have no idea, right? That and space again. So death and life are both part of aliveness, right? Animism reminds us of that. Animism, like I said earlier, it's that reminder that evolution is a process of integrating what was once indigestible or poisonous and adapting, right? So there's no perfect idea of healthy stress and conflict or competition can be helpful in the right quantities and in the right ways. But I think one of the things that animism is really helped me do is remind me that everything moves at a slower pace. Right. So in this virtual world that's happening right now, this trajectory that we're on where everything's becoming more and more virtual, it's happening like that, right? Like so fast. Things are sent fast. Emails just appear, right? Like we've lost so much of that liminal space, that space between when you'd write someone a letter and they'd receive it. Right. And like, is it great that we can now call each other, email each other, and it just like happens like that? Yes, absolutely. And that is not the speed that most of geological time unfolds at, right? So there's also something about presence and listening that we lose without this animistic cosmology bringing us, reminding us of this deeper relationship with the earth, of this slower pace, right? So to be with, to assume that the world has soul and everything in the world has soul means that if I want to be in relationship with it, I have to slow down and I have to learn to listen. And because they don't speak English <laughs> or speak the way we humans speak, the way our communication is developed, it reminds me that my presence is ultimately what's communicating and ultimately what is causing those ripples that the world is then around me is then responding to, right? So that brings in a much deeper, and this kind of ties in again, a little bit with these elder roles, with these medicine people roles, like, right? Like how many of us have gone to some wellness offering because like the web page was pretty and the Instagram feed was nice. And the person really had that fancy yoga pose or really looked like they knew what they were doing and promised these results that we were longing for. And then we get there and we realize that the person can only teach us what worked for them, but can't actually teach us how to find our own way to whatever it was they were promising. Right. And that's not, in, again, that's not inherently bad. There still might be something we can learn from that. And if we slow down and we listen and we pay attention to presence, we become much more discerning about what our lane is, what somebody else's lane is, right? which supports us not being as greedy. It sort of flies in the face of capitalism tells us we have to have all the certifications and we have to have all the skills, right? Because, you know, jobs love to hire people who they can pay for one position while doing the work of three or four or five or six positions, right? Like on a capitalistic system, that's a quote unquote good business model, right? 
but in a biodiverse ecosystem, that's unsustainable, actually, not only for that thing, but also for then for all, all the other ecological niches that get um, wiped out. And in the, again, in the larger cycles of things, that doesn't mean that doesn't happen sometimes. And that doesn't mean that that isn't part of the larger evolution, right? And it feels like right now we're living in a world where we're encouraged to learn everything that we're, we think might be of interest to us or learn everything that worked for us, right? This is another piece. What I eat is not necessarily what I have to give back. The medicine that has healed me is not necessarily my medicine for the world right? Capitalism teaches us if we love it, we should like figure out how to get certified in it and then turn it into a side hustle, right? And when we do that, again, things, it's like, it's, it's crowding out. It's that individualism. It's that um, lack of respect for the larger ecosystem, lack of respect for expertise and not even just expertise in the sense of like having the certifications and having studied this, the stuff, but like expertise or experience. That's like the long drawn out. This person has been devoted to this their entire lives. Right. And that's very different than this person took one weekend and learned some stuff and is now teaching it. And we all start there. Right? We start not knowing. And then it's a question of, do we stay with the learning? Do we stay with the unfolding? Do we let what we're learning shift us and change us? And then do we let how we're sharing that with the world shift us and change us? And does it become this like breath in, breath out, right? Oxygen, carbon dioxide kind of exchange. So animism, I feel like reminds us to kind of come back into that sense of relationality. So I'm going to wrap it up there. I feel like I've been talking for a while about this. <laughs> and like I said, this is just thoughts I have right now and they're incomplete and they're imperfect and they're where I am right now and they will probably continue to grow and evolve but I just wanted to leave you with that because I think I, for me, it feels like animism is a key piece or, or some sort of larger sense of kinship and relationality with the wider world, some sense of deeper responsiveness and responsibility to and for both ourselves and those ripples we're sending throughout the world is a piece that we really need to keep reweaving in. And again, not that it has to change this virtual world direction that we're going. There's a lot of benefit and a lot of possibilities that open up with the technology that we have and with a lot of the things we're doing. So this is not about going backwards, right? But this is about looking at where are we going? What's the trajectory we're on? And if we imagine it out a few steps further, where does it seem like it's taking us? And for me, when I look at the trajectory that it seems like we're on and I imagine where it might be taking us, I'm. it feels like, you know, deeper into cults, deeper into misinformation, deeper into disconnection, deeper into um, individualism and this like complete lack of any sense of responsibility for ourselves and for each other, to each other. Right. And then to the wider world, to the animals, to the plants, you know, species are dying out at an enormous rate. And we can't overnight change that. And we may never be able to bring back some of the ones who are gone already. Right. Like those trajectories may be too set for us to completely change. But that doesn't mean we can't grieve them and mourn them. And that perhaps there's something in allowing ourselves to grieve and mourn what is being lost that helps us become more human again and helps change the trajectory of where we're going. So that's sort of my prayer, my larger prayer for myself and for the world in 2023 is just continuing to deepen into relationship with place relationship with these ancient tools, with these ancestral rememberings. 
relationship with what's here and now, relationship with what may be coming. And to just somehow be my most whole self through and with that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> and so, yeah, may it be so. May we find worldviews that nourish us and that nourish the world. May they change us so that we can be more of who we are. So I'd love to hear if any of this, um, yeah, really landed for you or shifted anything for you or um, awoke anything within you. I also welcome hearing if there are um, you know, I have some ideas for people I want to have on and conversations I want to have. And yet I also welcome hearing if there are people you want to hear me have conversations with on this podcast or subjects you want to hear about. So you're welcome to um, find me on Instagram. It's um, wild sacred journey underscore KP. And you can either direct message me or uh, you can email me Kate at wild sacred journey.com. And I'll have both of those in the show notes. Um, yeah. And otherwise, you know, share, keep sharing the conversations wide. And, um, if you can rate them wherever you are, you know, sometimes you can like give it a like or a, you know, subscribe, or sometimes they may even have stars, um, depending on where you're listening to this, you know, good ratings always help boost the podcast and the algorithm if somebody else, somebody new is searching for it. And so, yeah, I just want to keep spreading these conversations wide. So thank you for being here with me in this, um, around this virtual village fire <laughs> and, uh, and in these conversations and in this really heart centered, um, desire to, to fall in love with life and to be an expression of love in life. Um, much love. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>